Okay, it's coming up. Trying to get it to go live. I'm not sure what's going on. On oh, my end, it says Facebook live. Go live. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, it's showing live. Well, listeners, I am waiting for a moment to see if we're actually live. It says we are. Um, so welcome to this week's thinking, this week's Black Mental Health is Little <laughs> Health. I am your host, Bronwyn Lucas, a little confused today, but hey, it was showing not live, but it's showing live. So we're going to believe that we are live. How, um, hopefully you guys have had an awesome day. Uh, we are here to do part two of education with our guest, Kenetra Cooper. And um, I'll let her introduce herself in just a second, but we've got to start off with some breathing. And tonight I'm going to switch up on you on breathing. Those of you who've been with me for a while, you know, you know the drill. Well, we're changing the drill. <clears throat> so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to have you breathe in to four, just as we normally count in slow, deep breaths, but then you're going to hold it for four seconds, and then you're going to exhale. It's called box breathing. Um, so we'll, I'll count you in, so let's get ready. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, one more, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, how was that? So you've been breathing with us for a while, Kinetra. How was that box breathing for you? I can definitely tell the difference. I can yeah. definitely tell the difference in just the relaxation of your body and just that holding it, the difference that it makes. You got mm -hmm. me on the last one because I was holding it. You said release. And I was like, oh. I know. And I forgot. I forgot. I forgot. That was on me. <laughs> okay. No, I thought that was part of it. I was like, okay. Yeah. In, hold it, and then release. Got it. So... It's a way, again, that breathing, I'm just doing more. And that's something you guys can all do yourself any time of day or night. It allows you to just relax. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in traffic, when you're when that coworker comes up and they just say something that makes you want to, I call it an itchy hand. They can only, <clears throat> when you have that itchy hand and you want to hit somebody instead of that, do some deep breathing and calm yourself down. One of the things it does is put more oxygen into your temporal lobe. And that's a part of your brain that allows um, rational thinking to take place. So it's very important to do that. Well, we're here tonight with Kenetra Cooper. She's back and we will be discussing uh, more on the schools. We ended last week talking about violence in our schools and we're gonna pick up, well, talking about bullying specifically. But I'll let you introduce yourself again to the audience and tell them something cool about you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Miss Kenetra Katrina Claudine Cooper. Some know me by KK and family members know me by Nini. Um, I'll say that something interesting about me is I am in the process of becoming a surrogate. And that is exciting to even know. And I told her we're going to have you back just to talk about that <laughs> process. 
And because I don't think a lot of African Americans are even aware of the process and the way that relates to mental health for those parents who can't have a child on their own and need that surrogate, the outside help, um, it fulfills, it can make them feel fulfilled to be able to have that child. Um, and we're, we're going to have you back and talk about that, because that's a interesting topic. But tonight, we're here to talk about um, bullying. Mm. I have this little quiz, and I, since we're doing this, I might be able to do a share screen. And yeah, and we're going to pull this bullying up. I've got, it's just seven questions. And we're going to see how you do. And audience, you can see how you do. Hmm. Seven little questions to test your knowledge about bullying. And so number one, children who regularly bully their peers are at greater risk for other problems, problem behaviors like stealing, vandalism, school absences, and substance abuse. True or false? I think that is true. And you are correct. Children who bully often have other family, school, or emotional issues occurring that contrib contribute to their actions. They need help to address their bullying behavior and other problems. So, you know, when we think about it, that bully isn't bullying in a vacuum. As it says, they have other issues going on. Um, but I won't give anything away. I'll just do the next six. Students, uh, schools should have a zero tolerance policy for bullying, expel students who participate in bullying. True or false? That's difficult because I think part of it is and part of it isn't. Um, I'm going to tell you, I agree with the um, first part, but the latter part, I don't necessarily think that is the remedy for it or that should be the consequence. So I'm going to say false. And you are correct. Zero tolerance policies often prevent students from reporting bullying and can negatively affect the school climate. Strict punitive policies can punish everyone involved, including the target of the bullying and the bystanders. They leave no room for identifying the cause of the problem and finding appropriate solutions. So when a bullying situation, you have the bully, the bullied, and the bystander. The bystander Absolutely. is the one who sees it. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of zero tolerance situations, the bystander is also punished. Well, if I see you bullying somebody, I may not feel empowered enough to um, help help you because I may be scared of that same bully. So I'm going to be um, punished for that. That's why that one. Yeah, because well, we hear zero tolerance and think, yeah, that's the way. Hmm. Next one. <clears throat> Children who are bullied are the only ones affected. I'm pretty sure that's false. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Each person involved in bullying needs support. Everyone involved in bullying is impacted by it. The bully, the one who is bullied, the bystander, and the one who bullies. Bullying can cause anxiety, depression mm -hmm. for the one who is bullied and for the bystander. Children who bully others are often at higher risk for substance use and other problems. You know, we talked about they have family problems and um, other emotional issues. Mm -hmm. Children who witness bullying should always step in to stop it. I'm gonna say that's false. And the key here is always. No, Absolutely. sometimes you put yourself at, at risk. In, in danger, yes. Yeah. Most bullying is witnessed by peers. Not all children are comfortable stepping into it and may not be safe you may become the target of the um, bullying. So stopping, stepping in, now maybe going and report it anonymously, that's, that's something else. Having a safe, supportive school climate helps prevent bullying. I think that's true. Yes, some of the most effective bullying prevention efforts to work to um, work to improve overall social and emotional climate of a school and foster positive uh, social behavior among all students. So when you have part of that is it's just a, a safe environment. If I feel safe, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. going to report it. And, and when you think about the bullied, 
the bully being a person who maybe is coming from just a negative background, maybe it's a bad home environment, maybe they're already using drugs, maybe all this, if their school becomes a safe environment, it might decrease their negative energy, everything mm -hmm. they're putting out, and it thus decrease their need to bully. Absolutely. Two more. If your child is bullied or social or cyber bullied, you should reach out to the parent or guardian of the other children involved to address the problem. Although that may be true <laughs> how I grew up, that is not true in how it should be handled. So I think that is false. You are correct. <laughs> now remember, I'll read what they say, but the other side to that is you have parents who will tell their children, uh, somebody messes with you, but you better not come home unless <laughs> you uh, beat them up. You know, exactly. But if that is a parent and you're going to them, hmm, might not be a good sense. They say that this could make matters worse or create more problems between the children. Instead, you should reach out to the school if the incident took place outside the school, uh, contact, and they were at a program or something, you know, you contact that. If it's cyberbullying, you can take uh, screenshots of it. And if they are in the same school, you could, you know, there are ways to do it. But going and knocking on somebody's door that you don't know. <laughs> Mm, I don't think so. No. And the last one, cyberbullying negatively impacts both the one who has been cyberbullied and the one who is cyberbullying. In my heart, I think that that's true. Yeah. Cyberbullying, just like regular bullying, mm -hmm. it impacts both. Yep. And yes, it negatively impacts the bully. We don't think that it does, but it does. You two experience cyberbullying can experience anxiety, stress, depression, fear, shame, and humiliation. Cyberbullying can also negatively impact the reputation of the one who is doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, comments and content posted online leave a digital footprint, footprint that can last forever. Mm -hmm. Colleges mm -hmm. often research applicants uh, online and employers may do the same in the hiring process. So you might be the one who is um, doing the cyber bullying and you know you've kind of got through it now you you're trying to get in this college maybe you want this scholarship and they go through your social media page mm -hmm. and find out that you've been social you've been bullying your chances for that scholarship could diminish just because you were uh bullying someone online and you don't even think about it um but what you do online, it lasts forever. You can take it off your page, but let's say they go look at your friends' pages and they see posts that you post. Mm -hmm. So yeah, your digital footprint is there. Absolutely. So hmm. So that's just kind of, I, I thought that was interesting. Your, your feedback on that little quiz, I just kind of sprung it on her, but you did good. You did. <laughs> Yay. Um, I, I do think that it brings up a lot of valid points, and I think it clears up some misunderstandings that a lot of people may have about how to handle cyberbullying cases um, from a parent perspective, as well as just understanding the one being bullied and the one that is doing the bullying, that they're both dealing with something. And so although the bully may be dealing with something that we're unaware of or um, we may not uh, even understand, they also are going through something. And so they need just as much help as the one being bullied. So um, I think that that was a pretty good quiz. And I think that for those who are out there listening, that really brings some, some light to the situation because bullying is definitely a problem, especially in our schools today. It is. And you know, last night, uh, last time we kind of started talking about that, uh, and you gave any updates. You had in the case where one young lady was being bullied Mm -hmm. And the mother took it to the school and nothing happened. And her daughter was jumped and she filed a police report. She mm -hmm. is pressing charges. Mm -hmm. Any update on that? Um, the latest is that they are going through. Um, at this point, um, the parent is asking for this information to be forwarded to any type of special programs a young lady is in. So I think the young lady takes some classes at one of the specialty um, facilities here in Arlington and AISD, and that's a privilege. And she's like, she's lost those privileges. So she's wanting that information to be disseminated to those entities. Um, 
so that this young lady can definitely, as well as the parents, can definitely understand that this is a zero tolerance. And um, parents, if you're dealing with it, you have plenty of resources and you have plenty of action that you can take um, against any person who is bullying your child, but there is the right way to do it. And so, again, like I said, I do applaud this parent. She is going through the proper um, channels to um, facilitate the process through the school. Um, since it did happen off campus, she did notify the authorities, and that information is now all being compiled because it did start and it did continuously go back and forth, and it it happened at school as well. And so. She's definitely following through, and I guess waiting on that court date to be assigned. And here's the interesting thing. When we looked at that quiz on bullying, one of the things that pointed out was that the bully is often someone who's dealing with a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'll be honest, for most people, it's hard to have sympathy for the bully if you're the parent. My child is being bullied. Okay, well, then your parents need to get it together with you. What do you say to those who have issues understanding that the bully might have something going on? And I know that it's difficult because when your child is the victim of bullying, you know that it's creating, you know, concerns and it's creating issues for your child because you're there and you're able to see your child is either coming home talking about it or you can see a change in your child's behavior and one of the hardest things is sometimes you know our kids won't even tell us what's going on so um that's definitely something to be um mindful of but then when you think about the bully themselves if a parent is notified that their child is potentially behaving like this at school. I think they're just as responsible for trying to figure out what's going on with their child. Um, a lot of times we overlook that we that our, our, our children don't know how to handle emotions. They don't know how to communicate them. They don't know how to articulate what they're feeling. And a lot of times they come out in ways that we would never imagine. So you may say, no, my child isn't bullying anyone. They, they had to do something to my child or my child said. And, and to be honest, in this particular situation, this is what the parent also said is, you know, she was doing this to my child and there was, you know, evident and evidence and proof that it was this particular young lady who was initiating all of the communication, all of the contact. Um, and so I, I wonder, did that parent ever sit down and have that a real conversation with their child to say, okay, they have you on camera doing X, Y, Z. Why were you doing that? Um, mm -hmm. Even with me as a parent, um, my kids consider me to be stern and I'm always so... Um, I'll just keep it at stern. They think I'm very stern and I'm very demanding, very forceful when I speak. Um, and with me knowing that, when I tried to talk to my teenager when she was in high school, she was reluctant to share things with me, um, mainly because she didn't want to disappoint me or she didn't want me to stress. And so I did seek counseling for her um, because I wanted her to be able to talk to someone. Um, and so I think that's important for even the person or the, the family that is um, with the child that's doing the bullying is to try and seek help. If your child doesn't feel comfortable speaking with you, you need to try and get help for that individual because you just never know. I mean, it could turn into something very differently where they're posing harm on other children to turning and posing harm on themselves. Um, and so I think that's something we have to keep in mind that these children these days, they just do not know how to articulate emotions. They don't know how to communicate what they're feeling. They don't even know what to do with their feelings half the time. And so we as uh, parents and adults and guardians, what have you, whatever the title is, we do have that responsibility to also help and try to protect that and to try to steer them into the right direction as well. You bring up some good points. Uh, when you think about it, we said we talked last week, we hit on it that the coping skills of our children today, of society today, is just lacking. And I linked it to, in my mind, 
uh, we don't do problem solving in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know how to problem solve academically, but it mm -hmm. also takes away the ability to probably diminishes the ability mm -hmm. to problem solve in your personal side. Absolutely. Um, you don't think it out. We just react. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I got to get the answer. I don't need the process. And that same mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. translates. So that Absolutely. Impact mental health in that, um, as you said, we don't, our, our younger people don't process emotions because that involves some problem solving to be able to figure out what I'm thinking. And if I'm just bam, 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 here, right here, I don't have time to really think about how I feel. Uh, there are those who feel like um, that's not part of public education. That we don't need to deal with that in school. Hmm. Not where. If you think about the <laughs> amount of hours a child spends in school per week over the whole, you know, their lifetime during during the school year, that's a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. Why not address something such as it? You know, social emotional learning was a buzzword for a minute. Um, and it's had different names over time. I can think, you know, back in the 90s, it was the same thing, really. We called it something different. Absolutely. But it, it ebbs and flows. But the problem is it we keep taking it back out where we are teaching um, empathy. We're teaching emotional wellness. We're teaching children how to manage their emotions. That emotions mm -hmm. are real. They're part of your life. And it's just as much, just as real as reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic. It's just as real. But we have taken that out. Like I say, the ebbs and flows. Now it's social emotional learning. Um, but that those type of things come and go. I mean, they should stay, you know. Um, I don't know. Where is, what is the state of social emotional learning? Is it still as in vogue as it was right around the beginning of before COVID? To be honest, and so I am not directly in the classroom any longer, but I don't know that I've heard my colleagues talk about it as much. Um, I think the talk now is we need to make sure that these kids are ready for STAR, and we need mm -hmm. to make sure if they didn't pass last year, that they have so many hours on so many different you know platforms. And so, and, and I could be absolutely wrong, but I just know that when I um, have conversations with my colleagues that are still in the classroom, I'm not really hearing about um, the push for social emotional. And it probably comes up, um, and I know we're in the second semester now, and so it's testing time. And so yeah. I can see it would make sense to me. I can see schools not focusing on that social emotional piece um, because it's testing time. And it's like, you know, we're in boot camps now, getting ready for STAR. So, um, but then again, I hope that schools are. I know that um, several districts, including the one I'm in, have platforms with resources that are available to um, administrators and teachers throughout the year to help with support. I just don't know um, if, teachers are actually having an opportunity to take the time out um, to actually go through those social emotional um, protocols and lessons and things of that nature. And here's the thing, from a mental health uh, perspective, if we give attention to the social emotional side of a child, we mm -hmm. will see a greater impact on our test scores. Because mm -hmm. if I feel safe, I feel I can manage my emotions, um, then I can think more clearly. If I can think more clearly, I can pass your stupid little test because I can <laughs> focus on your test. But if I have a lot of emotional baggage right now, I can't focus on your test. Yeah, I that can't because I have all of this bottled up emotion. I don't know what to do with it, but it's here. It's bottled up and I have to keep it bottled up because I have to focus on this test. And I'm, maybe I am being bullied or maybe this is going on or life is stressful at home and all this is going on. And you expect me to just sit and pass your test. Okay, so I stuff it down. And that's when we see some of the explosions that we see in children. Mm -hmm. So yeah. personally, I think from a mental health perspective, it really is just as important. And I believe if we would focus on that, we could see an improvement in our test scores. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I so mean, I like that. I like that you brought that up because that was always my approach in the classroom is building a relationship with students because um, just you, you just cannot teach a student that doesn't know that you care about who they are as a person. And so 
Now, I'm going to be honest. I wasn't fund of the social emotional lessons and things that they had, but I had my own way of making connections. And so it was, it was simple things like every day of the week, um, there was something we did to kick class off, you know, regardless of how much I needed to get through. But I always started off with either teacher tell a story day or let students tell a story or something where I was able to connect. What did you do this weekend? You know, and, and to go around the room and, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like everybody wants to raise their hand. I'm like, okay, you have like 10 seconds to share, but then I can relate to that. And so I just have my own ways of building those relationships. Um, and I know teachers, we are underpaid, but when those students invite me out to games and orchestra concerts and uh, dance recitals, I went to those things because I knew that, I may have been the only adult in the audience for some of those kids. And that was another way of me helping uh, build relationships and help them with the social emotional side. And, you know, at one time I even purchased um, some roses and uh, to, to, uh, gave it to one of my students after their performance. So there, there, are, there are different ways that you can do it, but it, 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 you just have to take the time to do it because these kids need it. And I think that is a key. It is it is not just the packaged social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. It isn't because because you could do everything in the book and still not have any connection. Mm -hmm. And that adage, they don't care how much you know until they know you care, is very true. I mean, Absolutely. I can remember too back in the classroom, you know, going out of your way to to do to connect with your students uh, mm -hmm. and making the classroom a safe environment. I started my classroom day with uh, we call it news time, and everybody mm -hmm. like share something. And um, I even did it when I taught special ed, and I had kids mm -hmm. who were barely verbal. But mm -hmm. I had one kid who could not. He was autistic, had lots of issues, and he was learning. This is elementary, really learning how to verbalize. He had his time to talk too. Mm -hmm. We might have only understood one word. And I would hold on to that one word and you did, da, 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 you know, wow. I'd ask him questions like, and how is your sister? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I did not know what he said, but even, you know, I was a speech therapy minor back in grad school. And I know that just giving that, gener that opportunity to verbalize and over the course of the year with him, we began to understand, he began to talk better because who was giving him a chance to just talk to someone? Um, but the students were more connected to each other as well, because if you're sharing every day, and I'm like, it was quick, it didn't take a long time, um, but if you're sharing every day, you know each other, and if you begin to connect with people, you treat them differently. And even in just doing that in the classroom, even if, let's say, you had 20 kids and then you're doing this and they connect with that 20, I know that I can connect. Children aren't given enough time just to have that human connection. We've taken, um, I can remember at one point, recess was taken out of schools. And an interesting thing uh, was the recess time was diminished. But one of the findings, and I, this was when I predicted, these same kids are going to start having more fights. You know why? Right, when you're on the playground, if you're going to tell the teacher every time there's a skirmish and you don't handle it yourself, you're going to sit down and they're going to sit down. You miss your recess because the teacher's tired of you just coming to them. So you had to handle it. And if you did get into a fight on the playground, then you're going to, you know, get in trouble. So you mm -hmm. had to learn to problem solve once again. <laughs> um, and plus, you need that time just to be free. The, the mm -hmm. idea of the movement, breathing the fresh air, being outside is very important. And when you take some of that away, it's not a good thing. So again, school can work against it. And when you look at social emotional learning, that's part of generating that um, positive social interaction that um, you know, we just need with kids. You know, we've talked about bullying. I wanted to look at violence. Um, mm -hmm. Are you aware of the six-year-old who shot the first grade teacher in New Newport News, Virginia? Unfortunately, I am aware. <laughs> You know, when you first hear it, you're like, oh my gosh. Most people are thinking, what kind of parents do they have? What parent leaves a gun out? That parent's gonna have to be fine because you know, in certain states, if the if a child has a weapon, the parents are charged for not keeping it safe. Um I kind of get that. You know, you can the parents, they did say they they kept their gun in a secure place, not secure enough because. <laughs> Obviously not. 
Um, and that is where we jump to. But this particular child, I, I looked up, you know, I was looking today, what, because you haven't heard a lot about it. And this is a quote from the parents. I kind of want to read it to you. It says, their son suffers from acute an acute disability and was under the care, a care plan at the school that included his mother or father attending the school with him and accompanying him to school to every class every day. The family said this, the week of the shooting was the first week when we were not in class with him and we will regret this for the rest of our lives. Um, so I don't know if they were there, not there because it was like, okay, we think he can handle it. But so truly, this was a child with some issues. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times we see this, and what do we do with those kids who have severe issues, you know? Yeah, and I know that now um, all the classes have moved to inclusion. So mm -hmm. they want to keep those students that um, suffer from different types of learning disabilities or physical disabilities. They want to have them included with the general population so that they can learn how to function. But um, as this particular um, student should have had some type of um, parental supervision, which that's that's great that that was in place. Again, I'm curious to know why um, mm -hmm. those those measures weren't taken on that particular day. But um, it is something to, to think about because yes, I do feel that like our special ed kids, I do think they do need to um, learn how to function, you know, amongst other people. Um, but we have to make sure we're following those uh, measures and protocols to provide them with that support to help them do that, um, not just for their protection, but for the protection of the other students. Um, and so I'm just grateful to God that it wasn't a student. And it doesn't make it any better that it was a teacher, but um, it just really could have been a, a lot worse. And I'm, you know, and I am grateful that it wasn't. So and when you think about it, um, and I was especially a teacher, and we do, I, inclusion has its merit, but when it comes to in having them participate in regular classes so that they learn how to get along the population, we're not teaching regular, so-called normal kids how to function. Right. <laughs> that goes back to this whole social emotional, we need to focus on it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to put you in the classroom so you learn how to function, but we're not going to really help you with that. You just go and get it. Oh, well, they're not getting it either. You're just there. So to me, that speaks again to the social and emotional learning, to mm -hmm. spending time every day. Well, we only we have to do this many minutes with this. We have to do this many minutes with this. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about the mental health of our country, of our children, of our adults, Um but we're not going to put any time in it. You know, there is a focus to put more money into mental health. Part of that needs to be in our school. There should be minutes al allocated to our emotional well-being, just as there are minutes allocated to the academic. However, yes. we have to find somebody to do it. I don't expect teachers to do it. Mm -hmm. They're not trying. We don't use counselors for that. You know, at one point, and in some districts, you know, there are counselors who go in, and I've had positions where, as an elementary counselor, I went into the classroom and did with what was called classroom guidance, and you actually taught emotional skills. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of mine in one position I had, I'm a storyteller, so I would go in and tell stories. Hmm. And kids love to hear stories, but then we talk about the stories and the stories were all designed to teach, you know, a lesson, but our oh, story lady is coming, you know, um, or I'd go in and teach. I was even in one building where in middle school, I would go into the classes hmm. and do some things. Yeah, I would go in through different subjects, you know, to try to hit at everybody like English because everybody takes English. So I might spend a semester uh, doing, I might only hit um, each kid one once a semester, but it gave them a con connection to the counselor because now you really see this person who's in your face. And I, if there were issues going on at the school, I just kind of switched my lesson and it fit that. Mm -hmm. um, but those few minutes would make a difference if we just instituted it where um, across the board. I've even done work in high school where I would go in and do some stuff. Some of the teachers were like, okay, look, I'll give up some time. We have too much 
issues, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And you'd exactly. have teachers that would say, okay, well, can you come in and do a lesson on such and such? And I might spend 20 minutes in a classroom. Mm -hmm. That I think is important. Let's put it, let's allocate time, actual time to um, working on their emotional well-being. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I think that that's a great idea. And I think that is definitely something that needs to be um, focused on. Now, will we get there? How close are we to getting there? Mm. Mm. Right, let's say that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a hard fail to administrators. Absolutely. And so unfortunately, it does fall in the lap of our teachers, right? So we as teachers, we have to be creative. Um, I would have, you know, teachable moments all the time. Um, sometimes I would see behavior and I would see actions and I just had my own way of dealing with that and trying to get to the root cause. And so if I had a student that was misbehaving or that was, you know, being disruptive to another student, um, a lot of times I would remove the audience. So I would, mm -hmm. that student and I would, would go outside and we'd have a conversation one-on-one -on -one, um, because a lot of times some students just want to be on stage and mm -hmm. you know, act a certain way. Um, it's not necessarily that there's really something there as it relates to how they're responding, but it's just, they want to be on stage and, you know, mm -hmm. this is how. And so when you remove that audience, you get to really see through that student. And then a student gets to see me as well. Um, and that was always one of my tactics is to, to get the students one-on-one -on -one and look them in their eyes, even if I had to sit in a chair, because, you know, it's kind of like when you're looking down at somebody, well, I'm not that tall. So of course, <laughs> when I moved up to the higher grades, you know, it's more I'm looking up at students, but, um, you know, just always keeping a, um, a monotone, just making mm -hmm. sure to stay calm and, and just asking questions. And so that's one of the things that I would always do. And so one of the approaches that I'm um, at the last school that I worked at, you know, when we would see students doing something that they're not supposed to, we would ask them, what are you doing? So we want to get them to articulate oh, I'm on my cell phone. Okay. What should you be doing? Oh, I should be reading pages 75 and 76. Okay. So what are you going to do about it? And it's like, I'm going to get off my phone and I'm going to start reading page 75 and 75 to 76. And so I like those lines of questionings because it took it off of, you get off your phone. You're supposed to be reading your book. Um, you know, that's not always the best way to handle students when they're already not doing what they're supposed to do. So I do like the option of giving students an opportunity to reflect and to think about what am I doing? What should I be doing? And then me, me as a teacher gave me an opportunity to assess if when I got to question number two and they was like, uh, oh, so you don't even know what you're supposed to be doing. So we're going to start there. Um, and so I just think that in the same way that we um, want our students to think about their behavior and think about their social and emotional and how they're responding um, as much as we have on our plates. Teachers have the same responsibility and it's like times 25 times 30 sometimes in these classrooms and so I know that it can be a lot but it can be done um, for the most part but I think that it's important to just take a little bit of time out to just help these kids think through emotions and, and, to, and to try to find out what the root cause of things are. Um, it, it just makes it so much better for the student and the, for the entire classroom environment, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the other side of that is teachers aren't even prepared to teach this type of curriculum. Hey, you want no. me to get one more thing to my plate? You know, if you ask the teacher and say that, you know, but it can make your life easier. No, it can't because it's one more thing I got to do. Yeah, and they got to pass that, the test. <laughs> yeah, they forget that. Even though, and you know, it's hard to, can because you can't convince the administrator that they should add, allocate time to this um, so that it will improve your scores, you know, they no, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Um, but I was also, I had another thought about, oh, something you said I wanted to comment on, um, and I just forgot it, about um, dealing with all of this. I totally, it's gone out of my mind. Um, um, oh, but in the teachable moment, and that is the thing, mm -hmm. we have to, again, train teachers how to make 
uh, anything could be a teachable moment. I'll give you an example when I, especially a teacher, and my kids, I so I could do this whole inter, interdisciplinary thing where my reading and math and everything could come together. So my kids would earn the right to do a, a project. And this day they were, it was Thanksgiving. I taught reading and you had to read X amount of books per month. If you read X amount of books, you got to participate in the end of the month activity. If you didn't, you can't participate. I was a resource that you had to see in your room today. Uh, and after that first time month, nobody missed it because they realized <laughs> I'm in. Um, so this particular time the kids were cooking, I was, I was adventurous or stupid. We're going to just say adventurous because I had, uh, didn't blow up the room. We had the toaster oven I bought from home, a microwave, and something else. We had plugged in different, you know, parts of the room, had different stations. Mm -hmm. And in one station, they were making pumpkin bread. If you, and since it was a math and reading, you had to read the recipe and we were studying fractions, you had to cut the recipe in half. Okay. Each ingredient. Mm -hmm. It's simple, just cut it in half. If you're making pumpkin bread and um, you miss cutting the liquid in half, it will never bake. It will not solidify because you only need that much of it in it, right? So, of course, the students were upset because they, they, it was a problem solving. You had to go back and figure out what happened. How much did you put in? What did you do? What did you do? What is half of this? And you finally get to little Johnny and he didn't cut it in half. He just poured the whole thing in. So, of course, the students were angry because now you messed it up and our table didn't get it right. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. Musa, calm it down. Because <laughs> I also knew to have double of, you know, whatever we were baking. Here, do it again. But in that moment, it wasn't just a math lesson and, you know, the science of cooking and how things work together. It also was a, a social emotional learning moment because there was anger to deal with. They were, they were mad for real. Because now uh, we're not going to be able to eat when time is up <laughs> and all of this, you know. So, yeah, there was a lot going on. The, the emotions were high, let's just say. These were elementary kids. The emotions, they were mad at so and so. But we took it and we talked about it. Mm -hmm. talked about being forgiving and had a whole bunch of lessons so you're right when you can take that teachable moment and it wasn't a lot I mean I did a lot in a very little time because we, mm -hmm. we got to cook we got to get back to plan uh it's got to bake and we had our little Thanksgiving dinner that day mm -hmm. and later on we had the dessert I said I tell you what I know when you each have lunch I'll bring it to you you know for lunch and when it bakes mm -hmm. But we can take those time and realize how teaching emotions can be part of your classroom. Mm -hmm. Because I, I could have just done the math part of it, but then I took time to process the emotions. Mm -hmm. And when, we're, but teachers aren't trained to do that. That was, I think your personality is like mine. We just, we just do that. <laughs> you know, but it's more of a personality issue than teaching. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I kind of learned from my mom. You know, that was how she handled it. So we didn't get spankings. We got to talk to. And when you had to solve your own problems by being by talking it out, yeah, sometimes be me. Please, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> please me. So I learned to talk things out. I learned to think it through and that carried through in my teaching. In the two seconds we have left, yeah, the two minutes we have left. Um <laughs> What would you like to say? What final remarks? I had a list of other positive things we can look at, and I have one I'll mention, but what would you like to say? Um, I would just like to say to everyone, um, just to take time to have those conversations with your, with your kids. Um, no matter if you're <clears throat> uncle, auntie, grandma, mom, dad, um, have those conversations with your kids because, as I said, kids, we've, we've talked about it, kids don't know how to process emotion. And a lot of times in certain um, communities and in certain ethnic backgrounds, a child's voice is not always heard. Um, it's suppressed. And it's so important because even I, as a child, I just wanted to be heard and just giving, you know, them an opportunity to, okay, don't curse at me now, but I'm going to let you, okay, well, how are you feeling? Like, what do you really want to say to me? Um, you know, how are you really feeling? And unfortunately, I have a 13 year old who will tell me exactly how she feels. Um, 
about her mom at times. And, you know, it can be harsh, but I can hear her through and then we can talk about it. And so I would just challenge you to just really start to give your children an open forum and a space to actually be heard, especially by the ones they love the most and um, the ones that love them the most. And that leads into my call to action. And my first one was get help for your child if they need it. Don't be, um, well, we, we got this. It's okay to seek help. And also get help for yourself if you need mm -hmm. it. It is okay to say, I, I can't handle this child. Because sometimes truly you can't. So get help so that someone can help you manage this child. Um, don't say, I'll just wait till they're 18 out of my house and you're creating <laughs> problem for society when they do turn exactly. 18. Mm -hmm. But get yourself help emotionally. It is okay to seek out help for your um, own mental health. Mm -hmm. That social emotional learning that the kids are learning, well, a lot of parents don't know it either. So okay. seek out ways to get help. Talk to your child and don't just talk, listen. Mm -hmm. Watch, observe, listen. If you can't talk to them, find somebody that you can't talk to. And that might not even be professional help, just that friend of yours who mm -hmm. they may trust. But let them get it out. And I always say voting is important. Why does it? Here is a direct correlation between voting and education. In the state of Florida, the governor, Ron DeSantis, has determined they cannot have AP African American history as a course. Mm. Now we need to separate education and politics so much so, but this is why it's important how you vote. So the governor can make a determination that what is gonna happen in schools. So whether you think they should be separate or not, they're not. So who you put in the office matters. Absolutely. So be an educated voter. No what issues are out there. In the state of Texas, all I can say is, Lord help. <laughs> I, I can't even articulate anymore. But be that educated voter because things like that are not just going to happen in Florida. I want to thank you once again for coming. And we're going to have you back about that surrogacy. That'll yeah. be later in the year. That's an um, awesome topic, something we want to pass on to our viewers. And so those out there who are listening today, thank you for joining. I am Bronwyn Lucas, the Caring Counselor, here to help you become a better you. If you're in need of any kind of mental health help, reach out. If you're watching on Facebook, you have my information. Um, but I'll give you the number. It is 682-272-3949. Reach out. I'm here to help you become a better you. Thank you, Kenetra, and I will see you later. Hi, thanks for having me.